making money doing things that I enjoy. And that is to this day, that is still my goal. I don't have a goal where I have to make 100,000 a year or 500,000 a year or whatever. I just want to make as much money as I can. I think I could just quit nine to five job. I remember this Saturday and it was back in 2011, 2012 timeframe where I walked out to my garage and I, I reached up to open up my garage door uh, as I normally would just without, w- without thinking about it. And for whatever reason, something stopped me from opening the garage. Even though I have all the things that I thought I needed to have to make my myself successful, I still didn't feel all that satisfied or fulfilled with what I was doing in life. You know, working a nine to five job that I had to work to finally achieving financial freedom where I don't have to work anymore. I could literally do whatever the hell I want with my time. Luckily, that's where I am now. Welcome back to the Virtual Ventures Podcast. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez. Today, we have a really special guest, Steve Adock. Steve is the author of the Millionaire Habits newsletter. Steve has an amazing following on social media, and I'm super excited to have him on the show to talk. How are you, Steve? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, right off the bat, this is this is a newer like relationship for me as well. I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Well, my story begins as um, somebody who graduated with an IT degree in 2004. But from the minute I set foot in the office, I knew that this wasn't going to be the right fit for me long term. Uh, I think I remember me, you know, kind of asking myself the question, you know, this this is it. This is what I have to look forward to for the next next 40 or 45 years. That's probably not going to work. I didn't necessarily have all the pieces in place back then. I mean, I certainly didn't really back then, but I knew that I didn't. I knew what I didn't want, but I didn't necessarily know how to get there at that point. But, you know, those things kind of happen and you learn as as, as you go. And you know, eventually I got to the point where I think I could just quit nine to five job and really on myself to go out there, earn a living, doing what I love to do. Now, in my case, we achieved financial independence early in life, so I don't really need to earn any more money, which is a great position to be in. But I mean, anything that I do earn is just icing on the cake. It allows us to upgrade our lifestyle a little bit, at least to a degree. Um, Certainly don't want to get forced into the whole lifestyle inflation thing that I was certainly really guilty of when I worked a full-time job, just earn and spend and earn and spend. Um, but yeah, it's it's certainly a unique lifestyle that I'm living now, and I'm certainly um, grateful that I'm able to live it. That's awesome. And I know a lot of people like yourself, they go and step into that nine to five and realize this is not for me. And that resonates a lot with me. I'm at a young age. I just started my career. Thankfully, I got to join a really cool company and get involved in a lot of cool things within technology. So as of right now, it's it's stimulating for me and fun. And let's be honest, the pay is really good. So that's great for me starting early in my life, trying to get life started. But I can't ever get away from that little itch to build things after work, to go do things like this on my spare time. So I'm curious for myself how it'll play out because every day I wonder how much longer I'll stay engaged because of all these other things I love to do post work. Um, so it's it's cool to hear. Was there like a turning point for you? Something that happened that was like, all right, it's time to quit this and turn the other way? Well, I, I remember this Saturday and it was back in 2011, 2012 timeframe where I walked out to my garage and I, I reached up to open up my garage door uh, as I normally would just without, w- without thinking about it. And for whatever reason, something stopped me from opening the garage door. And instead, I just turned around and looked what was in my garage. So on the left-hand side, I had a brand new Cadillac CTS. On the right-hand side, I had a nice. 1999 supercharged Corvette. And right in the middle, I had a Yamaha R1 Sport. And I was in my house in the suburbs. And I think that was the first time where I allowed myself to admit that even though I have all the things that I thought I needed to have to make myself successful, I still didn't feel all that satisfied or fulfilled with what I was doing in life. And that's such an incredible moment to know that you have all of this crap, all of this stuff (laughs) that's supposed to make you happy, but yet you still don't feel like 
you're doing the right thing or you still feel like more to life that you can that you can either achieve or 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 kind of explore or experiment with and that was again that was ju- that was i guess the turning point toward my financial independence journey um i was a big reader online and i found a blog called mr money mustache anybody who's in the personal finance or early retirement or financial independence community knows the name mr money mustache he was a software developer just like me so i connected with his story very very closely and i started to read more and more of his blog i liked the way he talked i liked the way he wrote it's very like very unofficial down to earth like you're having a conversation he cussed on his blog, which I which I did back when I had a blog and all that good stuff. So it was it was, I it, I just related to his story, and he really indirectly, based on his writing, helped me put the pieces into place to go from you know working a nine to five job that I had to work to finally achieving financial freedom, where I don't have to work anymore. I could literally do whatever the hell I want with my time um, and just have fun every single day. And luckily, that's where I am now. That's awesome. And I definitely want to tap into what the financial freedom looks like for you and day to day. But first, something you mentioned early on was you got to quit your job and go do something that you enjoyed. What was that? Talk a little bit more about that. Well, I quit in 2016, December 24th. 3rd of 2016 was my last official working day. Best Christmas gift I could ever give myself. And yeah. for the next, for the following three years, my wife and I sold our houses and we lived in an Airstream RV and we literally just traveled the country for a living. That's what we did for the first three years. And wow. that that lifestyle certainly is not going to be for everybody. And frankly, it wasn't for us either long term, but for three years, it worked great. We could spend almost as much as we wanted or as live as cheap cheaply as we wanted. I guess I should say it that way. And we did. We lived on like 40000 a year for three straight years right after finishing our careers. So we were living very small, very minimally, traveling the country, seeing the United States of America. I learned way more about this country and really about life in general just by traveling, not, not going to school, not working a full-time job. I learned way more just by traveling. And that really whetted my appetite, I guess, for making money doing things that I enjoy. And that is, to this day, that is still my goal. I don't have a goal where I have to make 100000 a year or 500000 a year or whatever. I just want to make as much money as I can while not feeling like I have to. And that's a very interesting position to be in because there's a lot of pros and cons, pluses and minuses. It's a balancing act. So you don't, you know, go in a little bit over your head and start working yourself to death, which is what I wanted to get away from with my full-time career. Uh, so that was, that was where it started with travel and adventure and being location independent, making money from anywhere. And that is what I really love is being able to, to, to go to Mexico, to go anywhere in the world and still be able to bring in money because I'm not tied to a specific job in a specific location. That's what I want really for the rest of my life. That's great. And something I want to highlight for anybody listening, whether you're young, if you have a trip that you're thinking about taking that you haven't pulled the trigger, pull the trigger. I'm a huge advocate for traveling. All of the amazing, most of the amazing things that I've learned are through traveling within the United States and to different countries. And if you're somebody who's older and you're listening as well, go take those trips, go get out there. I know time seems to go by quick and I feel like the more I meet people, I'm always disappointed in that there's not enough travel going on. So I think that that was a great point. I'm happy you made it because I'm a huge fan of traveling, getting out there, meeting new people, enriching yourself in these different cultures. You will learn so much that you couldn't learn in school or online and things like that. One of the criticisms we get is if we stayed working, we could have made, you know, X amount of money over those years. We we probably could be a half a million dollars richer, maybe a million dollars richer at at this point, if my wife and I stayed working this whole time over over the last five or six years. And that's true. There's no kidding around that. But the other side of that coin is we made, we had, we had so much fun and we've made so many memories. There's not, there's no amount of money that can possibly place the experiences we've had over the last, well, I guess it's now six, six or seven years because it's 2023. Nothing could possibly <laughs> replace that. And one of the things that enabled, encouraged us, I think, to pull the trigger and take that first step is 
you know, we're young, we're healthy. We were in our thirties at that time when we set sail on, on all of this and we might as well do it while we can always good to be an excuse for you to say, no, not this year, maybe next year. And then that next year is maybe next year. And it's just this one more year syndrome where it's always going to be the next year. The next thing, you know, you're 55 and, and you can't, you know, you can't get around as, as, as well as you could have. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure we've all heard stories about this where, I mean, nobody on their deathbed ever wished they spent more time in an office. I think a yeah, lot of people would probably wish they spent a lot of time doing things, traveling, adventuring, whatever, having fun. That's what people wish that they did more of. And that is why there's no amount of money that could replace what we've done over the past seven years. That's super impactful. And I, I could I love the way you frame that. Like nobody on their deathbed has ever said, damn, I wish I spent more time in the office. Um, that puts a lot of things into perspective and that's really cool. We keep talking about this journey to financial freedom. I know it's a huge part about your brand and the millionaire habits and how to get people to become financially free. First, maybe let's talk about what your journey to financial freedom looked like and when you could say, hey, I'm financially free and then vice versa. How are you doing that within your business and empowering people? It's interesting because it's going to look a lot, very different to a lot of people. And one of the first questions people have is how much money do I need before achieving financial independence or being financially free? And that's going to depend heavily on where you live and also how much you spend. And third, what your net worth is. And I like to use what's called the Trinity study, which is the Trinity 4% rule, which means you can spend 4% of your net worth every year and stand a reasonably good chance of never running out of money again, even without working a job. You don't work anymore. You just live off of your investments. So for instance, to make the math easy, if you have a million dollars in net worth, you could spend about $40,000 a year and be pretty good. I mean, there's no guarantees in life. Odds are going to be in your favor. Yeah. The other way to, to look at that is the amount of money that you do spend in a year, multiply that by 25, and that is how much money you should have in your net worth before calling it quits, before achieving financial freedom. And another way of looking at net worth is your assets and minus liabilities. Assets are everything you own, stocks, real estate, even the equity in your house, which some people don't like to include, but I do, but because that is absolutely an asset. Minus liabilities, yep. your debts, things like that. That resulting number is your net worth. That is how much you are worth financially. That's how you, you come up with that number. So for us, it, it, it was kind of working backwards. We wanted to spend about 35 to 40K, so we needed to have about a million dollars in net worth. And at that point in 2014, 15, we were close because both my wife and I worked in IT. We make good money just like you do, but it also drained life out of us. So we had the income. We, we had the income there. Um, and we had a choice to make. We could either, you know, with $220,000 of combined income, and this was back in like 2013, back when 220 grand was really good money to earn. We could have lived like <laughs> rock stars, go on vacations, vacation homes, nice cars, dinners, all that crap. Or we can save as much as we can and quit our jobs and do what we actually want to be doing for the, for, for the rest of our lives. So we saved, get this, 70%, that 70% of $220,000 a year for the last two or three years of our working career. That adds That's amazing. quick. And it takes, yeah, it takes yep. sacrifice. It takes really like deciding what's important to you. Like cable TV, that was like the first thing to go. Um, and really cutting back hmm. on the things that you spend money on. It's a process. It's not going to be easy. But man, if you want financial freedom bad enough, are going to make those choices. And you're going to find out that it's way, way easier once you get over that initial hump to live a more minimal lifestyle. Yeah, I, I really couldn't agree with you more. And, and I try and always challenge myself. I mean, unfortunately, I live in Miami not the cheapest place to grow up, live, and want to go and, and start your life. So things are a little different from that perspective. But I'm proud to say I still live at home. Um, I'm not in a rush to get out of here. I'm a huge per advocate on 
don't rush out, like take the time, build up a lot of income with your first good job. And for me, the way that I challenge myself is I like to do 40, 40, 20. 40% 40% of every paycheck directly into a high yield savings account, 40% of every paycheck into the market. And then I have to live off 20% of my paycheck every month, get by. That not only has really helped me save a lot more and invest a lot more, especially because I got this at an early age. I'm 24. I've been doing something along these lines since I was 21. And The other cool thing that it's done, which it wasn't my intention at first, instead of reducing the money that I put in, instead of saying, oh, let me do 35 and 35 so that I have more to spend, I found ways to make the 20% higher so that it made sense, which in turn put more into the 40 and more into the other 40. So it's created this great system for me personally, where I've been able to really get ahead of it. You just described the best money management principle I have ever, ever, ever heard. And it's called the pay yourself pay yourself first method. I'm sure you you've heard that that phrase before. Where you fund yep. your savings, you fund your investments and you live off the rest. That is how you should do it. Most people are exactly the opposite. Me included in a previous life <laughs> by the way. Yep. I spent what I wanted out of my paycheck and then saved and invested whatever I had left over. Absolutely the wrong way to do it. But man, when you are my age, you're probably going to be 10 times richer than me because you started (laughs) these, I mean, you started pay yourself first in your early freaking twenties, man. I can count. I don't know of another person that young who knows about pay yourself first, first of all, but second is actually willing to put their money where, where, where their mouth is and, and save and invest first, that very, very rarely happens. You are going to be in such good shape with that kind of philosophy and making an IT salary, man. I just, that's, that's so awesome. Thank you so much. And it, it is hard. And, and luckily I also want to shout out my significant other. She's also doing this with me, following these same principles as we try and build up and, and start our life this way. And and it, and it's nice when your partner buys in as well, but it, it's hard. Mm-hmm. Like we're young, there's times where we wanna go out and have a good time. And not to say that I don't enjoy myself, cause I do and I do go out. You have to make some sacrifices. There is times where you wanna pull from the savings or you wanna just put a little bit less into the investment account. Once you make that a really concrete habit and like a non-negotiable, for me, it's been amazing. Like I'm. I'm able to make payments, go on trips, debt-free, never have any debt. I pay all my credit cards every month, no debt whatsoever. And like, to me, feels amazing and is what excites me to continue doing that no matter how much my income grows, any side businesses and money I get. Even if it's a $500 referral that I'll get from helping somebody within a client, 40% of the 500 into the savings, 40% of the 500 into the investment account, and then 20% to my regular checking. And it's just, it's become a non-negotiable for me. And it's helped me so much. And I always tell people around me, like my core circle, I always want everybody to win like that too, because like you said, I know 20, 25 years, we're going to all look back and be like, damn, this was huge. I'll give you a technique for all for everybody listening, um, a technique to help encourage you to stick with your savings and investment plan. The problem that I had when I was younger is I effectively didn't have a reason to save. I knew that retirement was going to happen at some point, right? So I was saving for retirement whenever that happened to be in 40 years or 50 years. And when something is that far down the line, it just seems like it's you'll worry about that later or it's not a big deal now or it's okay if I take a thousand out and do, and do this with it. I'm not going to retire for the next 40 years or whatever. It's just such a long-term kind of thing where it just you feel okay spending a little bit more irresponsibly while you're young. If you have a goal, if you have a reason to save, and that reason could be anything, it could be early retirement, it could be college, it could be a down payment for a house, it could be anything, whatever whatever your goal is, your financial goal is important to have that goal because it's going to be the light at the end of the tunnel that you keep remembering. Like if I steal a thousand dollars from my future self, that's a thousand dollars I don't have for that home I want or for that vacation I want to take or to move to, to this place or that place. When you understand what you are stealing from, it's going to make it harder for you to do that. And again, 
that was my problem. I didn't have that. I just had this 40-year retirement thing in the future that was way too far off in the distance. But once my wife and I decided, when I'm 35, we're out of here. That's go It's going to happen. That made it way, way easier to start cutting back significantly, significantly on the things that we spent money on and padding our investments, padding our savings, and funneling as much money as we could away because we knew what we were saving for and it was within the next five or six years um, from, from the point where we started talking about this stuff together. Uh, so that is the key. Have a goal, understand the goal, write it down on a freaking piece of paper and and put it on your put yep. it on your damn refrigerator. It doesn't matter. Look at it every day, keep that in the back of your mind, and you're not gonna forget it. Yeah, I, I hope people who are listening are really taking notes here. These are amazing takeaways that can really improve you, your life, and your future self, which is really important. I think people unfortunately are a little short sighted um, and, and that needs to change. You've got to really look at the bigger picture and, and set yourself up for success down the road. We've been talking about me here and, and you've been really giving some amazing tips. I want to talk about the Millionaire Habits newsletter. How did that come about? How's that going? Give us a little in depth. Yeah, I wanted to create the newsletter that I always wanted to subscribe to back when I was on the ramp <laughs> up to, to achieving financial freedom. And that's that's what I'm doing now. Almost 16,000 people on Millionaire Habits right now. I send an email awesome. out every Saturday. It's about three to four minute read each one. So I'm not sending you a novel to read. It's very quick, very easy, very actionable, very direct and straightforward. That's what I always connected with. And I think that's what a lot of my readers connect with as well. It, it could be, I mean, it's just anything about becoming a millionaire or stealing the habits of millionaires. Because millionaires basically do things robotically without even thinking about them that produce income that builds wealth and those are the habits those are the, those are the techniques that I talk about every single week it's it's growing by leaps and bounds right now I really could not be happier with um, with the way it's working out um, and I really do enjoy writing those, those emails because again they're short and sweet I don't have to spend two or three hours writing them and you don't have to spend five or ten minutes reading them <laughs> you know for four minutes you're done and you are smarter than you were before. So that's one of the things I, I, I love about the whole process of writing this uh, newsletter and having people subscribe. Very cool. I had two of your buddies on the show previously. My episode with Clint just came out. My episode with Curtis comes out on Monday. Um, both of them built a really big following on Twitter. You did as well. How has building the brand on tw your brand on Twitter been a catalyst to the growth of this newsletter. And then two, I want to shout out, I personal opinion, I think going in all in on Twitter right now, you were ahead of the curve, but going all in right now is a huge opportunity. People like yourself are living proof that you built these amazing followings that create these amazing audiences. So I'd love to hear how that journey was. Yeah, there's no no better social network than Twitter if your goal is to make money. Yes, you can make money on Instagram and maybe even TikTok, whatever that is. I mean, you the you have so much potential, limitless potential on the Twitter platform, especially if you talk about money or self-improvement or health and fitness. Those are big, big topics on this platform. And my newsletter, Millionaire Habits, would not be where it is now if I did not have that following. It's such a great way to add people to your newsletter because the idea is when you're on social media, it's effectively a rented platform. You don't own your Twitter account. I don't own mine. You don't own yours. Nobody owns theirs. And it could be taken away tomorrow and you have zero, absolutely no recourse. If you have something like an email list or a website or a podcast, those are, me those are mediums that you own. You control them. Nobody is going to take those things away from you. So the idea of growing something like an email list or a podcast or anything, use social media as effectively like your outreach arms. You get people to follow you, you get you build these you build a massive fan base, but then you as many of those people as you can off of the shared platform, off of the platform you don't own, and onto a platform that you so if you follow me, I'm sure you realize almost every single tweet that I send out has a plug 
to my email list. Sometimes there's there's a giveaway yep. in front of it, like sign up for this free P- free PDF. I'll send it to you, and I'll also add you to my email list. I have about three of those, I think. Um, but all of that combined adds probably three or four hundred email subscribers a week, and that adds up quick when you when you have the following yep. that that I have at this point, which is almost. 250,000 almost I'm so so close I should get there but uh but we'll see but yeah that's that's overall that's awesome. at a high level that's the process get people to follow you then get people onto a platform you own and that's where the magic happens nobody makes money directly on Twitter I I will say that again nobody makes money directly on Twitter. What people do is they use Twitter to get the audience, move them to a platform they control. That is how they make money. Email is how they make money. Podcast is how they make money. Communities on Discord or Telegram, that's how they make money. They are using Twitter to direct people to a money-making platform. But Twitter itself, just like Instagram, is not how most people. There are exceptions with like sponsored posts and things like that. For the most part, that's how it works. So for someone like myself, this is a little bit selfish, but I'm sure we have listeners who are also in the same boat as me. I've built companies over the last few years and had success primarily on Discord. All of it was internal. I never really did the online thing. I never really had a social presence. I wasn't poster. I I, I see the value now. I want to go all in. What are some suggestions for people who are trying to get started on Twitter right now and want to grow a following and a brand? It's There are several things that I would say. First, the earlier, the fewer followers you have, I'll, I'll say this way, the less you should be just tweeting out into the void. Like if you have 500 followers or 1,000 followers, yes, tweet. Your main priority is to get your ideas in front of other people, get, I, get eyeballs onto your content. And when you're early in your Twitter career, the best way to do that is to comment, not just. So what I like to recommend people do is send out one or two tweets a day. That's it, like original tweets. But then spend the majority of your time commenting on other tweets from larger accounts. Add something insightful, not just, hey, I agree, or yeah, totally. You know, add something else to the conversation, add to it in some way. Then when when other people see your comment, read your comment, they will be more likely to follow you if it's, you know, if it's something insightful. Um, The other way is to network. Meet other accounts that are about the same size as you and also meet accounts and network with them. Reach out to them in DMs um, with accounts that are above you. So if you have a thousand followers, maybe reach out to a few accounts with 10,000 followers and 20,000 followers. You probably don't want to reach out to accounts with like 200,000 followers if you only have a thousand because that disparity can look a little strange and that bigger account might think that that you're just trying to get something from them that happens to me all the time every day Hmm. i get dms from people who just want something from me and i'm not the only one that happens a lot (laughs) but yeah keep it to accounts that are around your size and a little bit and that is essentially your engagement group or your networking group where you can talk about how to grow talk about what's working maybe you can like each other's posts or i mean technically retweeting relationships retweeting groups are against the twitter's terms of service um so i would go a little bit easy on that or especially take it off the Twitter platform and into something like Telegram, for instance. Um, but there's so many ways that you can connect with other accounts and help support each other's growth as you go. And then you will all together that way. Yeah, that, that, that that's great. And I am definitely starting to lean in now. And I finally have a product where the online presence is everything. So I'm almost yeah. forced to jump in. Um, And I think the biggest change for me is going away from just posting content to actually having a content strategy, um, which is going to be a huge differentiator. So that's something that I'm excited about that I'm working towards. But I really appreciate you dropping 
those nuggets of information and helping people like myself, because just from a personal perspective, like I've never had a big account and I look at accounts like yourself and in my head, I was like, man, like, how am I ever going to be able to talk to Steve? Like he always posts this cool stuff, like has this huge growth. Why would he answer a DM like mine getting into the podcast world? It's allowed me to start to talk with amazing individuals like yourself. I always tell the people I'm interviewing, like, this is a little selfish from my perspective. Like I want to learn too. And this is a cool way that we could do it at scale. So that's a huge motivator for my podcast is I'm not looking to, it's not about money. It's not for monetization. If it comes, it comes. This is more for me to build my network and continue to meet amazing people at scale with some purpose behind it and be able to add value to you as well. Like the clips and constantly sharing the posts and being an advocate for other people that want to meet with you. Or when I get reached out saying, oh, you had that person on, can you connect me? Yes. Like that, that's what I'm doing this for because I see the value in that. I see the value in having a big social footprint with the way everything is trending towards. So again, me rambling, but that was those, that information that you provided is, is so helpful to smaller accounts that are listening yeah i mean ultimately twitter is a social media outlet social media the point is to meet people and connect with people i've i've connected with with some amazing people out there i've listened to elon musk talk on spaces with with somebody i follow um wolf financial i'm sure you've you've heard of them they've had conversations i mean how many people get to have a conversation with one of the richest men in the world twitter it twitter just does that and if you tweet if you treat it if you tweet it (laughs) if you treat it (laughs) like a social media platform and you're not just sending out platitudes and calling it a day which some accounts do and you're actually engaging with your audience you're responding to comments you're liking other tweets you're retweeting other people that is what makes spending so much time on twitter valuable because you're actually learning you are contributing to the conversation and you're expanding your network just like you you said and that that is really what makes all the time that that you put into social media so rewarding yeah and twitter spaces i think are super cool Wolf is a is a great guy. He was actually episode two for us on the show. Oh, and awesome. thanks to him, I was able to Yeah, and thanks to him, I was able to meet you, Curtis, Clint. Like so that's a perfect example of somebody gave me a shot to speak on spaces with very little credibility, but it was something I was really passionate about. It went well. I joined multiple spaces and just kind of told Wolf, Hey, I've got free time right now for the next month or two. I want to come on and just help in gaps you need in spaces where you don't have a ton of speakers. That helped me meet other individuals. He agreed to come on the podcast, posted the podcast on Twitter. He he commented about you guys on my podcast. You all saw it under the thing, retweeted it, helped me get a lot of growth. And then I got to meet and, and talk to all of you. So I think that's just such a, such a cool real-time example of how we got here. And just a great example for people listening. Just put yourself out there. I had like 400 followers loved investing. So I thought it was cool. I was like, Hey, Wolf, like, can I be a speaker? Cause I requested my hand. Now we're here uh, two and a half months later and I've got a full on podcast and I'm interviewing amazing people like yourself. So if that's not a testament to what social platforms can really do, I don't know what else is. Yeah. I think, I think there's a lot of imposter syndrome out there where people just don't feel qualified, but it's not the hell with that, man. I mean, just, just go out there and try it. You, you yep. never know. I'm, I'm not an expert on, on all things either, but that hasn't stopped me. It shouldn't stop you. It really yep shouldn't because there's always going to be a reason to say not yet or I'm not ready. But that is not how you become successful. You become successful by getting in a little over your head, figuring things out along the way. And (laughs) even if you do fail, who freaking cares? At least you tried. You have this mountain of knowledge and experience now that you're going to take with you to that next thing that you're going to try. And you're not going to make those same mistakes again. You keep doing that over and over again. And dude, it's impossible not to succeed. It's impossible not to build wealth if you just keep trying. No doubt about it. 100%. 
I mean, this is great because I feel like you and I are really aligned on a lot of this stuff. And I, I've said it again and again, I could not agree more with your point. Um, a way that I like to kind of wrap the shows up or get to the end part, we, we talk all this business, all these amazing things. I like to ask a super simple question. The answer can be literally anything you want it to be as complex or uncomplex as possible. And the question is, what are you, Steve, excited about in the near future? Well, it's hard to actually dial back. It's like there's so many things <laughs> excited about. Really, I the thing that I am excited about is what I am doing, Clint and Curtis, with the Twitter growth community. We are putting together a cohort-style training program. Gives you the roadmap on growth, going from a small account to a big account, exactly how that happens. From getting your profile right, to writing tweets that sing, to writing threads that are just like a magic magnet for growth, how to network appropriately. Our, our next cohort is in June. And I mean, those guys are just so unbelievably motivated and determined, just like I am, uh, to teach how this works. Because the more people that grow, the more successful we are all going to be, the more fun we're all going to have, and the more money we are all going to make. So it all adds up into something amazing. So that that teaching people how to grow on the Twitter platform specifically is definitely what I'm the most excited about in the near future. I might have to take you guys up on that and, and, and jump in there and learn from the best. And is there a way for people to sign up already for that pre-sign up? Um, Doors if there are is, opening on is there? May 16th. And there's going to be... Okay. All right. Heavy, there's there's going to be a heavy discount for 48 hours, by the way. Hint, hint. Heavy discount, 48 hours. So um, that, that will be... I'm sure that will be all over our timelines and our email list and thing, things like that. So it's probably going to be impossible to miss it. Um, so just uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. Okay, cool. And, and this episode is going to go live on the 22nd. So be more than happy to throw something in the bio for anybody who's listening that wants to sign up and, and be a part of this. Um, and then where can people follow you? I think everybody's super lazy. So if you want to say a great place to follow you, but for those people who actually will do the work and open up the bio and read it, uh, all of Steve's socials will be linked there. Um, but maybe just say your primary out loud. Yeah, my primary on Twitter is Steve on speed, all one word. The on speed part has nothing to do with drugs. <laughs> it was back when I drove a Corvette <laughs> and and rode a Yamaha or one racing bike. So was the on speed. Really wish I changed that when I was smaller, but it's too late now. So I'm just gonna <laughs> I am doubling down. I am Steve on speed and I'm gonna be Steve on speed. Awesome. Well, Steve. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This was an amazing conversation. I'm extremely excited for people to get to hear this amazing story and looking forward to our continued relationship. You are very welcome. I appreciate the opportunity and um, onward and upward to everybody out there listening. Thank you.